we're typically going to express amino acids when we're formulating relative to lysine following the ideal protein concept. And so when we look at the NRC requirement relative to lysine, it's at about a 45% ratio. Um, but our lab and then Dr. Wu's lab at Texas A&M and a couple other labs have, have done some work since then, since the NRC, that have shown positive benefits to supplementing arginine above NRC's requirement. Welcome to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine nutrition research digested for you. I'm your host, Clayton Chastain, and today we have with us Dalton Humphrey, a PhD candidate at Iowa State University. So Dalton, before we begin, would you mind giving the audience a short introduction about yourself? Yeah, definitely. First, thanks for having me again on the podcast. Always enjoy it. Uh, just a little bit of a brief background. I uh, grew up in Michigan, primarily involved with pigs through showing in 4-H and FFA, and so was involved in that side of the industry. Uh, continued in from there, my education in college, had a went to junior college at Blackhawk College, finished my bachelor's at Western Illinois University. During that time, I had some really good internships with uh, the Carthage system, and so spent some time there. And then from there, uh, started my master's at Iowa State, uh, stayed on after my master's for my PhD with Dr. Laura Greiner for both my master's and my PhD. Uh, my PhD has primarily been focusing on amino acid requirements and lactating sows and as well as nursery pigs. Yeah, I know we were talking about this a little bit before we started recording and this how you said that this was, it's been a year since the last time you were on the podcast, um, which it, <laughs> I felt like it was only a couple of months ago. It doesn't feel like it's been a year since we last talked. Um, but I've been paying attention to your research at Iowa State University for your PhD and kind of how it's centered around um, arginine requirements in nursery pigs. So to start us off, why is arginine so important for nursery pigs? Yeah, so... Like you mentioned, Dr. Griner's lab here, we've done a couple of studies looking at arginine. And when we think about arginine and swine, um, it's a little bit unique um, because typically we consider it a conditionally essential amino acid. And so when we think of the order of essentiality on amino acids, it's pretty low on the list. And we also consider it, like I said, conditionally essential because the pig does have the capability to synthesize arginine endogenously to some level. Um, through what we call the intestinal renal axis. So in at least post wean pigs, citrulline made in the enterocytes of the small intestine can be used in the kidney to make arginine. Um, when we think about arginine, it is a proteogenic am amino acid, so it's required for protein synthesis. It does have some roles um, in nitric oxide synthesis, so some immune function uh, there as well. And so those are, in my mind, kind of the two primary roles when I think of arginine and why it can be important in, in nursery pigs. Um, and so, so yeah, conditionally essential, typically, um, um, but when we think of conditionally essential amino acids, it's potentially potential that if we're not providing enough in the diet, the pig may not be able to endogenously synthesize enough to meet its requirement for optimal growth. Gotcha. So when you designed this study to look at arginine requirements in nursery pigs, what all did that look like and what did your results show? Yeah. So so when we think about the arginine requirement in nursery pigs, and our work is focused on nursery pigs, kind of the early weaning pig for the first couple of weeks after weaning. And when we look at the NRC requirement, it's based on a series of, in my mind, really good studies done by Southern and Baker in 1983. And so a little bit older work, um, but really good and high quality work in my mind. But when we look at that requirement, and when we think about nutritionists, typically, we're typically going to express amino acids when we're formulating relative to lysine following the ideal protein concept. And so when we look at the NRC requirement relative to lysine, it's at about a 45% ratio. Um, but our lab and then Dr. Wu's lab at Texas A&M and a couple other labs have, have done some work since then, since the NRC, that have shown positive benefits to supplementing arginine above NRC's requirement. And so... For this study, when we look through the literature, those studies have not been designed in a way to actually evaluate the requirement relative to lysine. Um, and so they've been focused more on as a percent of the diet or supplemental arginine. So we wanted to pinpoint, okay, if we think about practical formulation today, following the ideal protein concept, what is that requirement relative to lysine for optimal growth or maximal growth? And so for this study, we had 480 newly weaned pigs, 48 pens, and so we had six different dietary treatments of arginine. 
expressed as arginine, standardized ileal digestible, SID, arginine to lysine. And so we ranged from 45, so NRC's requirement was our lowest, all the way to 145. So our range was pretty big here. Um, and we did that because obviously we had, the NRC had good reason to believe that it was at 45. And so we wanted to make sure we were at least meeting that. But then we had some evidence to suggest that we could go higher, but there was some variability in where that higher level maybe was. And so we went up to 45. Um, we fed those diets um, for the first three weeks, for the first 27 days in the nursery period, uh, immediately post weaning for the first 27 days. And to give a little perspective on what the diets looked like, um, they actually were pretty, I call them semi-synthetic diets um, to get down to that lowest level, right? So we had a pretty high level of a, a majority of the available feed grade amino acids, as well as um, tyrosine and phenylalanine to make sure we, we were met on all our essential amino acid requirements. But then with that, we also formulated those diets to be sub-limiting in lysine. So lysine was second, secondarily limiting. And so that allows us to express it rel the requirement relative to lysine when we look at that. And so sublimiting in lysine, all the other essentials were at or above requirement. Um, and then we accomplished the different levels by just substituting arginine for glycine, alanine, and cornstarch. So to, by doing that, it allows us to keep the diets isonitrogenous, so equal in crude protein, but also equal in energy to try to mitigate any of the effects of arginine being, that supplemental arginine being used for non-essential amino acid synthesis and causing a response from that perspective. So we fed those diets for the first 27 days. It was split in two different phases, I'll call it. And so we stepped down the lysine requirement for the for the last 17 days of that 27 days to make sure we stayed limiting. Um, and then we switched all the pigs to a common diet for the last 14 days of the nursery period just to see if there was impacts in the first 27 days, if those would carry through to the end of the nursery, even if they were switched back to a common diet. And so what we saw was at, for the first 27 days, so I guess I missed this, but I'll give a little bit more perspective on the pigs. So about six kilos to 13 kilos is what we're looking at weight-wise. Um, I talked time-wise, but I think weight-wise is a little more um, applicable. And so if we look at that first six to 13 kilo pig, we saw a quadratic response in average daily feed intake and average daily gain in response to these levels of arginine. And so we saw that average daily gain that quadratic curve was maximized at an arginine to lysine ratio of 96 and feed intake maximized at an arginine to lysine of 97. And that did correlate then to a, a heavier final body weight at about the same level of arginine in that first, thir that first 27 days of the trial. Um, we did not, however, see any difference in feed efficiency, indicating it was a feed intake driven response there. And so... One thing that I think is important when we think about amino acid requirements, specifically when we're trying to evaluate amino acid requirements or fitting quadratic curves like this, is we may get a maximum point, but I think it's important to also consider what's our uncertainty, uncertainty around that requirement. And so we calculated the confidence intervals around that maximum point. We see that kind of ranges from 82 to about 112 across those different variables. So there's a little bit of a range still um, in that uncertainty around the requirement, which I think just indicates we need to do some more work to help refine that a little closer. Um, but we did then see from there, if we look at the whole period, so 41 days all the way through the common diet period, those effects did carry through the end of the nursery period. But we saw, again, average daily gain, feed intake, and body weight quadratically impacted by arginine. And so Arginine was improving growth up to about that 96 to 97 point on the curve. And then it was actually decreasing growth as we reached that 145% of lysine. Gotcha. So I wanted to ask you about that quadratic response that we saw when over supplementing arginine, because with some of these amino acid studies, we don't always see such a harsh quadratic response when you over supplement. So what is some of the kind of the mechanism behind that quadratic response? Yeah, it's a good question. And um, I think one thing to point out, I could have described this probably earlier, but when we think about model models for amino acid requirements, we can fit plateau models that would get rid of that quadratic potential, um, or we can fit quadratic curves, right? Well, in this case, if we look at the data, plateau models didn't make sense, um, and the quadratic curves fit actually fairly well. And so I think 
this quadratic res response was real, I think is the point I was trying to make there. Um, and so when we think of what could be causing that, um, there's a couple potential potential reasons in my mind. And so one, I'll point out 145% of lysine is very high. We wouldn't see that in any practical circumstance in diets. And so not necessarily a practical response from that standpoint. When we think physiologically or biologically in the animal, there's some older work done kind of around that same time the, the NRC paper, Southern and Baker paper was done where they're trying to understand arginine rel the ar an arginine to lysine antagonism and if it existed in pigs. Because in poultry, it does. It has to do with them using a ureic acid cycle versus urea cycle differences between pig and poultry. Well, most of that, that work doesn't really support a lysine to arginine antagonism in swine. And so it doesn't seem, based on the literature, that that is the cause of this quadratic response. And what those authors all tend to indicate is it's really more of an, a generalized amino acid imbalance. And we see that in most amino acids. If we get drastic enough in an imbalance, it will reduce feed intake. And that's typically the response we see. And so in this case, I think it's likely that's probably the case. We had just a generalized amino acid imbalance that signals to reduce feed intake to the pig. Um, mechanistically, there's potential arginine does, there's evidence that arginine will um, stimulate the mTOR pathway. So if we think about branch chain amino acids, leucine, we talk about reducing feed intake because of mTOR. It's potential that arginine is acting in a similar mechanism. Um, I don't, there's not, to, in my knowledge, any data to support that. But when we think about that physiologically, it's possible. But I think generally we can say it's probably just an imbalance causing some sort of mechanism in the pig that's reducing feed intake at that high level. Combining basic science with real-world facilities results in swine nutrition programs that deliver impactful, bottom-line performance. Hubbard Feeds is focused on helping you achieve your goals and make your life easier along the way. Choose a company that can match your appetite for innovation by visiting hubbardfeeds.com forward slash swine research. So based on some of the research you've done and some of the research that you've looked at, like you said, out of Texas A&M, what is your recommendation then for the next NRC in terms of arginine requirements for nursery pigs? Yeah, so I think one thing we can confidently say based on this trial and all the other work that's been done is that the arginine requirement of this age pig is is higher than the NRC, the 2012 requirement. I think it, it needs to be higher. Um, our trial indicates it's almost double that, right? We're If we think of the actual maximum point, if we want to shoot for that, we want to shoot for about a 96% relative to lysine. But I do want to remind everyone there is some uncertainty around our estimate too. We need to do more work. And so in my mind, we need to be at least hitting an 80, 81 arginine to lysine ratio as a minimum. But if we want to creep that up a little bit, if financially it makes sense, I think we could do that up to about that 96, even a little higher and be okay. Um, if I think to give perspective, what I've seen in diets that I've formulated, at least, this is obviously going to vary based on ingredients and everything else. But in some of the nursery diets we would formulate, which would include specialty ingredients, animal protein products, that kind of thing, typically levels in a normal diet are at around mid-70s to low 80s. We're not far on a lot of practical diets anyway, um, but to get there, we may have to supplement some feed-grade arginine, which is out there and possible if financially it does make sense. Well, I think that's all the time we have. So thank you again, Dalton, for coming on the show and good luck in your upcoming defense for your PhD. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yep. And everyone else, thank you for listening to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt podcast. Please visit us at swinenutritionblackbelt.com. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast channel so you won't miss out on the next episode. See you next week.